Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions, and we start with question number one from Marie Todd. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made towards the provision of local forensic medical examinations for victims of sexual crimes in Orkney and Shetland. Minister Annabel Ewing. NHS Orkney and NHS Shetland have both publicly committed to developing local services for the care and support of adults who have experienced rape or sexual assault. We are providing financial and practical support to assist the delivery of these new services that will ensure victims of sexual crime receive the best available help and support locally. We have also committed an additional £38,000 to Rape Crisis Shetland and Rape Crisis Orkney to further enhance specialist advocacy support services for victims on the islands. Marie Todd. I thank the Minister for that answer. Having met with Orkney Rape Crisis earlier this year, I know how crucial this service is and I welcome the fact that the funding has helped them to employ two new part-time staff who started work this month. Folk in Orkney and Shetland first highlighted that victims of sexual crimes have to travel to the Scottish mainland by police escort without a wash for examination. Can the Minister provide more information of the practical support to be made available, please? Minister. A key element of improving provision in Orkney and Shetland and indeed across Scotland is making sure that we have sufficient doctors to carry out forensic medical examinations and we are uh, providing an additional uh, £76,000 to NHS Education Scotland to redesign the current training model to make this more accessible to doctors, aiming in fact for an extra 50 doctors to be trained by March 2018. And we are delighted that both uh, Orkney and Shetland Health Boards will be part of this revised training approach, releasing key staff to pilot the new remote training course. We expect that lessons learned from the pilot will inform the future training model across the whole of Scotland, ensuring a greater consistency in approach in delivering these important services. Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you very much, and can I thank the Minister for her response, but also put on record uh, my thanks to the Cabinet Secretary for the work that he's done with Tavis Scott and myself, alongside local stakeholders and the local health boards, to ensure that services do better meet the needs uh, of uh, Ireland survivors of rape and sexual assault. Um, what assurance has the Government received that Orkney Rape Crisis and Women's Aid uh, will be included in planning of the forensic service around referral pathways and survivor feedback? And what steps are being taken to look at um, the delivery of services for child victims whose needs are very specific and the response uh, needed has to be tailored? Minister. Yes, on the, the first point that the, the member raises, I know that he has pursued this issue long and hard uh, and uh, with some, obviously, degree of success thus far, and we're continuing to make progress. Um, on the issue of involvement, I mean, we'd be happy to hear views uh, and I'm sure officials would be happy to, to meet with uh, uh, representatives of, of the organisations that he referred to. Uh, on the issue of uh, 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 children uh, and uh, the examinations that may sadly be required to be carried out, uh, I think it would be important to say to the member that uh, examinations required to be carried out as far as children are concerned with a paediatrician and a forensic examiner present. And whilst there are different practices across the country uh, at the present time, recent managed clinical network standards of service provision and quality indicators for the paediatric medical component of child protection services in Scotland state that this is in fact the standard to adhere to. Uh, so there may be also additional factors uh, in a case involving a child uh, witness, uh, uh, such as requirements to remove perhaps the child from immediate danger and other complementary medical professionals may be needed uh, in that case as well. But I can assure the member that we are currently uh, considering this from a national uh, point of view as to how we can improve the experience of children through the uh, justice system. And we are looking, I think the Cabinet Secretary alluded to this uh, the other day in the Chamber, at the Nordic model of Barn Barnahus, uh, and this will inform any national position we take and of course how that might be supported uh, in particular in remote and island communities and I'm uh, absolutely sure that the member will have further input that he wishes to make and that will be very uh, happily and gratefully received. Thank you. Question number two, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action its partnership action for continuing employment has taken in Lanarkshire in the last year. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, from September 2016 until August 2017, our Partnership Action for Continuing Employment, or PACE, initiative has provided skills deployment, development and employability support to 1,080 individuals and 31 employers based in Lanarkshire. 
Support has included PACE presentations on site, information on benefits, workshops on CV preparation, interview skills, job searching and one-to-one -one sessions on career management. Mark Griffin. I thank the Minister for that answer. Beyond the work carried out by PACE, can I ask the Minister if it's still government policy to relocate civil service jobs and agencies outside of Edinburgh and if the government have considered doing so for any of the new agencies, the Social Security Agency, Revenue Scotland, to compensate for the potential impact of HMRC closures in communities in Lanarkshire? Minister. <laughs> Sorry, presiding officer. Um, the, the, the member raises an interesting point. Clearly, the Scottish Government has demonstrated a record in the past of moving uh, jobs outside of uh, Edinburgh uh, to locations such as the borders. So I know the Public Pension Agency is based. And uh, we, uh, the colleague um, Jean Freeman is obviously involved with Angela Constance looking at the possibilities of establishing a uh, new social security uh, workforce in, in Scotland. So uh, I would leave it to the mem member to engage with the, uh, the, my fellow ministers on that issue. But uh, in terms of the wider point, we clearly are looking at how the government can support economic growth, inclusive growth across the country. And I'm very aware of the significant potential impact that HMRC job losses in Cumbernauld and uh, Lanarkshire more generally, uh, East Cobride particularly, uh, may have on the Lanarkshire economy. And I, I welcome the fact that after uh, uh, some discussion, particularly from uh, colleague Jamie Hepburn and Stuart MacDonald MP, that uh, Jim Logue, Councillor Jim Logue of North Lanarkshire Council is taking forward an economic impact study for the area, which will be very keen to see uh, very keen to see the results of that uh, and indeed if the member has been involved I apologise to the member if he's been involved as well um, but I'm keen to see the evidence of that and government will obviously study the results of that uh, very closely. Question number three, Bill Kidd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress is being made in delivering town centre status for underdeveloped areas such as Drumchapel in Glasgow. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, a local town centre has been designated in Drum Chapel within Glasgow City Development Plan, which was adopted earlier this year. Uh, with regards to other areas, we have set out in Scottish planning policy that planning authorities should identify in their development plans the status of a particular area. Local authorities are best placed to set the conditions to help an area thrive. Bill Kidd. I uh, thank the Minister for his kind reply. Um, the Minister will be aware, of course, that Drumchapel formerly had a much needed and highly successful shopping and entertainment centre, which was devastated by Strathclyde Regional Council's decision that it would not be a strategic shopping centre. And it was subsequently run down to the extent that it is now a small shell of its former existence, which fails to serve the needs of my constituents who need to travel for any significant shopping. I know this exists in other parts of Scotland, um, but this is a prime example. Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Scottish Government is aware that many town centres across Scotland are struggling, and a lot of that is down to decisions made in the past, like the one that uh, Mr Kidd has outlined. Uh, the Scottish Government will continue to work closely uh, with the retail sector to maximise its potential in relation to the town centre agenda. Scotland's town centre first principle, which we've agreed with COSLA, together with uh, a range of measures in the town centre action plan, set the conditions and underpin activity designed to tackle key issues such as empty shops. Uh, it also allows for the diversification of town centres and thereby attracting new businesses and services in these places. Uh, we recognise the value of a, a vibrant retail sector uh, and we will continue to work with others to ensure uh, that we carry on with these partnerships to improve areas such as Drum Chapel. Question number four, Pauline McNeill. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to follow up on the automation of benefits to help poorer families. Minister Jean Freeman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I know that this is an issue uh, that Paul McNeill has taken a keen interest in and the Scottish Government is keen to also progress it. We recognise that, where feasible, the automation of assistance can play an important role in helping people access their full entitlement to benefits and passported benefits. That is why the Scottish Government supported the Member's amendment on this issue in the Child Poverty Scotland Bill and will discuss automation with the local reference group established to develop guidance for local authorities and health boards on the duties that bill places on them at the next meeting, which is scheduled for October. Polly McNeill. 
Thank you. According to the Daily Record, the poorest in Scotland are missing out on £2 billion worth of benefits. Automation of certain benefits could make a difference to that. I would like to thank the Minister and indeed the Social Security Committee for supporting my amendment at Stage 2 and the commitment that she has given the Parliament this afternoon. I would like to further ask the Minister if any assessment has been done on what benefits might be suitable for automation or perhaps that is a subject for the meeting that you talked about and if there would be a requirement to allow for any adjustment in future budgets should automation be possible. Yes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I appreciate what the member is asking and in fact automation in the to the scale and extent that she is talking about beyond a single local authority and to the scale and extent that we wish uh, to pursue if we can as a, a Scottish Government is a bit more complex as I'm sure she will understand because more than one system is involved. Um, it would involve local authority systems, Scottish Government and of course the DWP for the benefits that they continue to be responsible for. Um, Realising that requires significant discussion. We, we will start around uh, the uh, child uh, poverty bill, as I've just outlined. We are continuing to look at it as part of our development of our own social security system and discuss that with local authorities and others. And indeed with uh, her colleague, Mr. Rowley's uh, support, very welcome support, we recently convened a round table discussion with local authorities uh, to increase benefit uptake across the piece we will follow that through with a follow-up roundtable, which he and I have agreed on. And from there, we will continue to discuss with, between local authorities and ourselves how we might pursue that, in practical terms, that significant Scottish-wide automation where it is possible. That all needs to be, in, be thought about and taken account of before we feed anything into a future budget discussion. And Adam Tompkins. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The um, financial memorandum accompanying the Social Security Bill um, talks of a £190 million cost associated with um, IT in the new um, Social Security Agency. Um, to what extent has the modelling that's led to that £190 million figure taken into account the possibility of um, automation of benefits? Minister. Well, that figure that Mr. Um, Tompkins refers to is, of course, in terms of the uh, setup of our own social security system in Scotland to uh, take responsibility for the 11 benefits that will be devolved to us. Alongside the work that is going on in that uh, IT build, learning the lessons, of course, uh, from uh, previous programmes, both lessons where those programmes worked and others where improvements can be made. Alongside all of that, our Chief Digital Officer and other uh, government colleagues are working uh, across our stakeholders, taking account as well in terms of what I've just said to Ms McNeill in terms of automation, but with a primary focus on building an IT system that can safely and securely make the payments so we uh, ensure that when we take over those responsibilities for the benefits, the 1.4 million people affected receive the money that they're entitled to uh, on the day that they expect that, to receive that. Question five, Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. I first declare an interest as a registered nurse um, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to assess the models of health care that are used in primary and community services. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. How NHS boards and integration authorities design and deliver their local primary and community services is a matter for them in consultation with all stakeholders, including members of the local communities. To support service redesign, the Scottish Government has made available £43.5 million during 2016 to 2018 to support around 70 tests of change and other activity through the primary care transformation programme. Emma Thank Harper. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. In light of local issues raised by those living west of Dumfries and Galloway, how does the Scottish Government directly support NHS Dumfries and Galloway to provide Galloway Community Hospital and local GP services with the support required while GP and other doctor vacancies are being filled? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, firstly, can I say to Emma Harper that we're uh, investing to ensure that NHS Dumfries and Galloway has the resource that it needs. Its resource budget has increased by 6.8% in real terms between 2010-11 and 2017-18. The board's resource is £283.6 for 2017-18, which includes an uplift of 
uh, £2 million. Uh, we also keep in touch with uh, the Health and Social Care Partnership regarding the important uh, community hospital and other issues. Uh, the partnership is committed to maintaining services at the hospital and is in considering how services can be improved going forward with a programme of community engagement underway and a hospital liaison group being formed and in terms of GPs we expect the health board as other health boards we would expect to work with local GP practices to help them overcome any recruitment and retention challenges and of course we are investing an additional 250 million pounds uh, per year in direct support of general practice by the end of this parliament as part of a wider 500 million pounds investment in primary care. Miles Briggs. Officer, Audit Scotland have repeatedly highlighted the Scottish Government's lack of progress in shifting the, shifting the balance of care away from an acute setting. How will the Cabinet Secretary ensure that current efforts make a real change? And specifically, what assessment has she done of the transitional funding which she's just um, read out today? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, can I thank Miles Briggs for, for that question. Uh, he will be aware, of course, that the programme for government laid out a very clear ambition uh, that by the end of this parliament, over half of the spend uh, will be within community health services. Now, that is a, a big transition, it is a big change, and will have an impact uh, as we move resources from acute services into community health services. So we need to make sure we do that in a proper planned uh, and a sustainable way, which is why, of course, I've asked Professor Derek Bell uh, to work uh, as part of a collaborative to look at the uh, transformation of elective capacity within our acute services so we can drive those resources into the community to keep people out of hospital. Neil Findlay. Uh, across the Lothians, GP practices under the current model are closing their lists to patients. Many are a GP resignation away from collapse uh, and are relying on locums to stay open. So what practical advice does the Cabinet Secretary have for GP practices that find themselves in this situation here and now? And will she apologise to patients for the government's mishandling and underfunding of general practice? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I said in my original answer, we will be investing £250 million uh, in direct support of general practice uh, every year by the end of this parliament as part of a wider £500 million investment in primary care. That is an unprecedented investment in primary care services, but I do recognise that there are recruitment and retention issues in a number of GP practices in the here and now, which is why health boards are, have been tasked to work with those practices to help them overcome some of those difficulties and they are providing real and practical support to uh, GP practices but it is also important that we make general practice a more rewarding uh, career opportunity for young doctors who are choosing their specialty which is why we're also ne negotiating a completely new GP contract that uh, we are very uh, confident will have that result and we're working with the BMA to deliver that. Question number six, Marie Goujon. To ask the Scottish Government what role the police and the Crown Office have in dealing with wildlife crime. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Uh, wildlife crime is crime and perpetrators will be investigated and if there's sufficient evidence prosecuted as with any other crime. However, we are aware there are characteristics of wildlife crime that do require a specialised approach. Uh, for example, it often takes place in remote areas where there are no witnesses uh, and of course there are usually no victims able to report what has happened to them. For these reasons, we are working with Police Scotland to expand the resources available to them to tackle wildlife crime with a pilot project to provide additional special constables in the Cairngorms National Park. And the Crown Office also has a specialist wildlife and environmental crime unit to tackle these types of crime. Marie Goujon. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the shooting of a hen harrier on the Cabrach estate recently and another recent disappearance of Coluna, a satellite tagged hen harrier near Ballater. In light of these incidents, what action is being taken by the Scottish Government to implement the recommendations of the satellite tagging review? Uh, I am, of course, uh, aware of these uh, appalling incidents. In the light of the satellite tagging review announced on 31st of May, um, that we would be bringing uh, uh, forward a number of measures, including setting up an independently uh, uh, led group to look at grouse moor management practices and increasing Police Scotland resources, as I've already mentioned. Um, uh, in in uh, uh, accordance with that, there's also been good progress being made 
um, uh, in, on those areas. Uh, I will announce further details uh, uh, shortly. In the meantime, uh, other work goes on with police responding to and investigating reports received and actions such as further use of restrictions on general licenses by SNH where it is suspected that wildlife crime has taken place. We are determined to put an end to this form of crime. Thank you. And that concludes general questions.